the next topic on our agenda is the power series. Now this one is a little bit different than everything else we've been doing so far. We're taking the first giant step towards demystifying those weird black, bo black box functions like sine x, e to the x, squared of x. Remember we talked about this, like when, the cal when you punch to your calculator, let's say sine of 3.5 or something like 3.5 to the power of 1.27. What is the calculator doing? We have no clue, right? One of the jobs of this chapter is it's going to make certain things more open for us. Instead of having a black box function, it's going to give us some polynomial equivalents for these black box functions. And we talked about the fact that polynomials are easy functions because basically polynomials are four operations. If I write down a polynomial such as 3x squared plus 4x plus 5, and I say, okay, evaluate this at x equals to 2. It's very easy, right? Because squaring something is multiplication. Then you're multiplying it by 2. You're adding something. Four operations we can handle. But what we don't understand is how the calculator does things at a power of one-fourth or, or sine or tangent inverse of a value. Those we don't understand. So if you could possibly change those weird functions into a polynomial, let's say tangent of inverse of x. It's not equal to this, but let's say that you could make it equal to a polynomial of more terms, perhaps. If that were the case, then you have basically reduced the function to four operations that is no longer a, a mystery function. It's very simple, and we can evaluate. So power series basically is a very fancy term of saying an infinite polynomial. So we're going to try to understand a little bit about properties of these infinite polynomials. Because in the next section, we're going to actually take, tackle this task of taking these very complex functions and trying to find their clones in terms of polynomials. Now, even though these are infinite series, for the first time, we're looking at an infinite series that is not a sum of numbers. Everything up to this point were summation of numbers, like 1 plus a half plus a fourth, etc. Here, we're looking at summation of functions, OK? So what we have is like a sub 0 plus a sub 1 times x plus a sub 1 times x squared. Basically, each one of these is a function. Like this is the quadratic function, right? This is the linear function, etc. So it's no longer we're adding just numbers, but we're actually adding up functions. Um, so again, power series is a very fancy word for saying something that looks like a polynomial like summation a sub n times x to the n represents a power series centered at 0. Come on down here. What you have there is called a power series centered at the point C. So if you have it something like this, it's a power series centered at C. If you don't have x minus c, just x to a power, that's a power series centered at 0. Once again, what these are are basically infinite polynomials. A polynomial has a finite degree. For example, a sub 0 plus a sub 1 times x plus a sub 2 times x squared. If that's all you had, this would be what degree polynomial? What, what is the degree of this polynomial? Remember, the a sub i's are numbers. They are coefficients of your polynomial. What is the degree of this, this polynomial? Second degree, right? Because the highest term is x squared. This is a second degree polynomial. So what we're saying is we're saying power series are polynomials, except that they never stop. So they keep going x squared, x to the third, x to the fourth, dot, 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 meaning that it's like an infinite degree polynomial. Okay? Uh, so we're going to use those to try to approximate those mystery functions. OK, there is something you should know about power series. And that comes by this theorem, which is also stated in your textbook. It says one of these three things will occur when you deal with a power series. They are very predictable functions, in other words. It will always be one of these three things. Either that the con series converges only at one point, which is at its center, meaning that it pretty much diverges everywhere else. Or it says that this, the, a power series may converge when x minus c is less than r. What that really means is, uh, if this is a point c, the center, you might go, let's say, r units this way, c plus r r units that way, c minus r. So within this radius of convergence, in this, uh, for values in this range, if x comes from this range, then the series will converge. Everywhere else, it will diverge. So it will converge here, diverge everywhere else. This is another thing that could occur. 
And the third thing that can occur is it converges everywhere. So it, one of these three things will occur for a power series. So, so that means that you cannot have this situation that converges, let's say this is a number line, say it converges between negative one and two, let's say, and then diverges over here, then converges again between five and seven. It cannot happen. If it converges, it's only going to converge over certain values in one, one interval, or it's going to converge everywhere for all x. So this is, these are the properties of a power series. And what we're going to use most is this statement right here. Most of the questions here are kind of preparing us towards the next section, where we're going to try to find these polynomial equivalents. And in that section, we're going to need to find the interval of convergence of a power series. And to find that, we're always going to be using the ratio test. So this is almost like a direct application of the last section. The ratio test will get a lot of use here. And please also see what it says here. Please note that the, we need to test the endpoint separately. I'll show you in the next example what we mean by that. Let's take a look at an example, such as x to the n over n factorial. The question is, find the interval of convergence for this power series because you know the moment you write an infinite series the question remains does that series converge or diverge in this case there's an unknown x a variable so it will depend on what x is as to when the series converges or diverges so our job is to find the values for x for which the series converges that's the question here and we will always do the ratio uh, follow the ratio test Anytime the question says, find the interval of convergence for the given power series. So we we'll always start with the ratio test. Ratio test says that limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. So for this question, that would be, okay, let's first think about what would be a sub n plus 1 here? x to the n plus 1, right, because I'm replacing every n with n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial, right? Okay, times 1 over a sub n, what will that be? So basically, a sub n is a given expression, right? So we want 1 over a sub n, so we're going to flip it and multiply. The question is, first of all, simplify this and find the limits. Okay, here, take a look at where the limit is taken. The limit is taken as n goes to infinity. So for all practical purposes, you can assume x is a constant because x doesn't depend on n. Okay. So we're going to use that idea in just a little bit. But first, let's simplify a little bit. Like n plus 1 factorial on the bottom, n factorial on the top. We know how to simplify that, right? the n factorials cancel there. And how about x to the n plus 1 on the top and x to the n on the bottom? How do we simplify that one? Because the top is x to the n times x to the first, the bottom is x to the n, and the x to the n's will cancel, right? So let's see what is remaining here. So we have limit as n goes to infinity of uh, let's see, there's an x left on the top and an n plus 1 left on, at the bottom. Okay, what would be the limit of this as n goes towards infinity? And remember, consider x to be just a constant value because the limit is taken as n goes to infinity. This will be zero, right? Because x doesn't depend on anything. This is not the first example I meant to do today because I want to show you something else. But it's okay. It's still going to give us an example. Um, so in this case, the bottom is getting larger and larger. The top x doesn't really depend on it. And it stays as x. It's just one value. The ratio goes to zero. Now, this is, the ratio test says if this is less than one, the series converges, right? Is this less than one? Absolutely, right? Therefore, no matter what x is, 
this is going to be zero, this limit, and it's going to be a number less than one. So when they say find the interval of convergence, basically we're saying this series is going to converge no matter what x is. So the series converges independent of what x is. No matter, as long as it's a fixed value of x, Therefore, the interval of convergence, anybody wants to take a guess? If it converges everywhere, if it converges no matter what x is, the interval of convergence is going to be negative infinity to infinity. It converges everywhere, so x can be anything from, as long as it's a fixed value, any fixed value, any real number, basically, would work in this case, and the series will still converge. Okay. So this one is a little bit unusual because we get a zero. It didn't depend on x. It's always going to be, uh, it's going to converge everywhere. I think the first example I wanted to solve with you guys actually was the one with just an n on the bottom. Let's do that one also. So same question. A little bit different this time. It's, in other words, find the interval of convergence for this function, this power series. The series is x to the n over n, as n goes from 1 to infinity. This one was actually the one I want to solve first, but never mind that. Yes. Pardon me? Yes. Yes, because by ratio test, the limit turned out to be zero. And the ratio test, if it answers less than one, the given series will converge. Exactly, because no matter what x is that, as long as the fixed value of x, that limit will be zero. Therefore, it will be less than one. So it converges for every value of x, basically. Mm -hmm. OK. All right, so let's do the next one I wrote down, which is x to the n over just n, as n goes from 1 to infinity. Same question. Find the interval of convergence. So anytime the question asks you to find interval of convergence, begin with the ratio test. So with the ratio test, we will have limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. In this case, that would be times 1 over a sub n. Now let's see how you would simplify this. So once again, this is x to the n times x, right? Cancel with x to the n on the bottom, so there's just an x left on the top. And I'm going to put the n's together, like n over n plus 1 is what's remaining in terms of the n's. And I can take out that x because it doesn't depend on n. What is this limit? Right, degree of the top equals the degree of the bottom, so that ratio uh, of 1 over 1 is your limit there. So what we're getting here is 1 times the absolute value of x. In other words, we're getting just absolute value of x here. Now, for convergence, what do we need? The answer from this limit should be less than what? Less than 1 by ratio test, right? So we need this to be less than 1 for convergence. So what that tells me is if we open this up in equality and rewrite it without the absolute value, that means x should be between negative 1 and 1. 
But remember what I said earlier. I said we need to test the endpoint separately one at a time. Okay. So once you get that answer, take each one of your endpoints and test them one at a time. So let's say at x equals negative 1, we're going to see what happens. And also at x equals positive 1, we're going to see what happens. Starting with negative 1. Basically, plug negative 1 back into the original equation for x, the original series for x, and see what happens. So for example, if you do that, you get negative 1 to the n divided by n. What do we know about this series? Converges or diverges? This is an alternating series, right? Negative 1 to the n over n. So you need to apply the alternating series test. And what would you get? The, this is an alternating series. What is the only thing I must do? What is the simple test that we apply for an alternating series test? You need to look at the limit of what? The limit of 1 over n, right, as n goes to infinity, and that's 0. So what is your conclusion? The alternating series test tells us does, does, it, does the given series converge or diverge by, by the alternating series test? Converges, right? If that limit is zero and it's a decreasing function, which it is, then the series converges. So what we're saying is that x equals to negative one, the series converges. And how about a positive one? Plug one and four x up there, one to the n over n. But one to the n is one. Now we're looking at summation of one over n. What test can we use to determine whether or not that series converges? Uh, this is not really geometric, right? Geometric would be something like um, maybe like 1 over 2 to the power of n. But good try. Any other suggestions? Summation of 1 over n. The p series is the easiest way. You could use the integral test, but it's going to be more work. p series with p is equal to what? That power is a 1, right? So this is a p series where p is equal to 1. So look at your sheet. What does it say about convergence or divergence? It diverges, right? Summation 1 over n diverges. So what we're saying is we're saying the following. At this point, there is convergence. At this point, there is divergence. How can we incorporate these two facts into our final answer? Remember earlier we said x should be between negative 1 and 1. And when we look at the endpoints separately, we've got these two results. So what we should do right now is, because it's negative 1, it converges. Here's how I'm going to leave my final answer. x uh, is greater than or equal to negative 1. So I put an equal sign over here because it was included at negative 1, but strictly less than 1. This is your interval of convergence. You can also leave it like this, brackets negative 1 comma 1 parentheses. We don't want to include the 1, but we want to include the negative 1. Questions? Yeah. But the logic is that when the x equals 1, you have the summation as opposed to when you did negative 1, you have length. Yes, because we were using the alternating series test, and the alternating series test told us take the limit of the sequence. Oh, because that one is the alternating, alternating series. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we found here is our interval of convergence. What does this mean? If you take any number from here and substitute it for x, basically any number from this interval, brackets, negative 1, comma, 1, parentheses, put it back for x, that series will converge. If you take any number outside of this range, say negative 2 or 5 or 10 or anything outside of this range, and plug in for x, then the series will diverge. So that means the given series only converges as long as x assumes values given by the interval of convergence. Okay? I'm going to give you another example to work on. Yes. Yes, brackets if you want to include that endpoint. So for example, at x equals to negative 1, see what happened? We said it was convergent, right? 
So that's why it's negative when I put a bracket, because I want to be able to include that endpoint. Whereas the other side, it was divergent there, so I put a parentheses there, okay? So either one of these would be okay with me. If you can leave the answer like this or like that. Either one can represent the interval of convergence. Now, sometimes in your textbook problems, they ask you for the radius of convergence. Uh, in this case, the radius of convergence would be 1, because you have an interval here of basically phase 0 to 1 to negative 1. So the radius would be like only half of that. This would be the radius of the convergence. The length of the radius is 1. Okay, but the interval of convergence is the actual values between this x value and that x value. Okay, the next one I'm going to give you some time to work on. Here's our question. Same problem, basically. Also in your handout. Find interval of convergence for this given seri power series. Okay, let's take a look at the solution. So here we have a power series, by the way. Uh, what would be the center of this power series? Not that it was asked, but remember x minus c to the n, where c is the center. In this case, this is like x minus negative 1 to the n. So the center is at x, at x equals to negative 1. That's the center of this power series, x equals negative 1. And we're going to see later on that uh, a power series approximates a function really well around its center. And the further away you go from the center, the worse off the approximations are going to be. But at the moment, all they're asking is the interval of convergence. So let's find that. We want to use the ratio test, as always. So we're going to limit as n goes to infinity of, again, the negative 1 to the n. I don't have to worry about it under absolute values. It's going to disappear anyway. So I'm just going to take everything else, replace n with n plus 1. times 1 over a sub n. Now let's simplify. Okay, x, one, x plus 1 to the n plus 1 on the top, x plus 1 to the n on the bottom. What are we left with? x plus 1 to the first power on the top, right? Similarly, 3 to the n on the top, 3 to the n plus 1 on the bottom. That's going to give us a 3 on the bottom. Any questions about that? We've done some publications like that before, right? So ratio test tells us if this is less than 1, the series is going to converge. Otherwise, it's going to diverge. So if we could solve this inequality, x plus 1 over 3 and under absolute value signs is less than 1, what is x then? Well, anytime I have an absolute value inequality like this, I can rewrite it without the absolute values as follows. x plus 1 over 3 is between 1 and negative 1. Okay. I still need to solve this for x, so let's multiply everything by 3. And then let's subtract 1 from all three parts. Okay, so I'm getting between negative 4 and positive 2. Now, what should I be doing at the endpoints? Can I assume it's going to both endpoints? I can put equal sign or not put equal sign. Can I assume anything? The answer is no. At the endpoints, the only way to know for sure is do them one at a time, starting with negative 4. At x equals to negative 4, here is what we have. Go back to the original problem which is summation of, okay, the question had negative 1 to the n. Okay, I'm plugging negative 4 for x. What would that give me in the next parentheses? I'm plugging negative 4 for x. Negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3, right? So I should have here negative 3 to the n divided by on the bottom, it, we had 3 to the n. Okay. Now, we've got to be really careful when we're simplifying these expressions. For example, the negative 3 to the n can be written like this. Okay. Negative 3 to the n is the same thing as negative 1 times 3 to the n. Would you agree with that? Okay. And I can distribute the powers. This is negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n. Right. So I can rewrite that in my next step as 
negative 1 to the n was there, and then for the other term, I'm going to put two pieces, negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n, everything divided by 3 to the n. So now I know these cancel. Now, what is negative 1 to the n times negative 1 to the n? That's negative 1 to which power? 2n. Now, 2n is always an even number. Negative 1 raised to an even power is always what? Negative 1 raised to an even power, like negative 1 squared or negative 1 to the fourth. It's always going to be positive 1, right? Negative 1 raised to an even power is always 1. So this series is as, as if you're adding infinitely many 1s. So what can we say about that? If you're adding infinitely many 1s, it diverges, right? You could say n term test, that 1 is not going to 0, right? So, but however way you want to use it, this one diverges because you're using, adding infinitely many 1s. Now try the other endpoint. Try x equals to positive 2. So get, go back to the original question and plug it 2 in there. 2 for x. And take a good look at this and please let me know in the next few moments if you think this series converges or diverges. Um, that one, you could use n term test because the one here, you could take a limit of that that is not zero, so therefore it diverges. Mm -hmm. summation of negative 1 to the n. You could use the same argument there as well, right? The limit of that is not 0, this negative 1 to the n. That keeps fluctuating. The limit doesn't go to 0, so it doesn't converge. Or we did this early on in this chapter. We said the sequence of partial sums. It was like 1, 0, 1, 0, something like that. It oscillating, once again, it doesn't go to a unique number, therefore it diverges. So again, you could just simply say both of these, they diverge by the nth term test. That might be the easiest thing to use. So if it diverges at negative 4 and it diverges at 2, what can we say then about the nature of this series? Uh, rather the interval of convergence. Earlier we had said this, right? Can we modify this at all? No, there's nothing we can add to it. So we're just going to say um, that is our final answer, basically. That the interval of convergence is in interval notation, I could say parentheses, negative 4, comma, 2, close parentheses. Okay. I want you, when you get a chance, to also do another example. Uh, please just write the problem, and I'll give you the answer so you can check it against that answer. Same question with this given series. x minus 2 to the n plus 1 all over n plus 1 times 3 to the n plus 1. Joshua, did you copy that down yet? No. Not yet? Okay. Okay, I will give you the answer to this one, so please do this one later. The interval of convergence for this one should be negative 1, brackets, negative 1, comma, 5, parentheses. Mm. And in the remaining time that we have,
I want to do one step towards that main goal that we know hopefully by next class we're going to be at the main goal. We're going to be able to find these functions. Okay, so all along I've been promising you we're going to find these nice and easy polynomials that approximate these complicated functions. One such complicated function is e to the x. It's a very complex function. I mean, if you were trying to find like the derivative of e to the x or do things with it, it gets very, very complicated, especially if you're trying to do it from scratch using the definition. Or, or imagine, you know, when you plug into your calculator, e to the power of a number, e to the point 0.2, what is it doing? You know, we have no clue what's happening there. So this will be our first function that we approximate. f of x equals e to the x. We're going to find a second degree polynomial for this. So this is the first baby step towards our ultimate goal. Ultimate goal will be finding an infinite polynomial because an infinite polynomial will approximate e to the x perfectly. A second degree polynomial will approximate it, but only for points around x equals 0. So the further away you go from zero, the more terms you have to add, and we'll see more about that later. But at the moment, we're just doing a very simple task. Find a polynomial, a second degree polynomial, that approximates e to the x for points close to zero. And the only restriction you have are the following. Restriction number one. The function e to the x and the polynomial p of x must be equal at the point zero. Second restriction. The derivative of f and the derivative of polynomial must be equal at 0. And the final restriction, the second derivative of f and the second derivative of p, they must be equal at 0. So you're going to see that if you want a second degree polynomial, you have to give these three restrictions. If you want like a third degree polynomial, you would put one more restriction. We also want the third derivatives to be equal. Okay. So with these three restrictions, we're going to be able to determine a polynomial. And we're going to use this to find e to the point 1, possibly without having to even need a calculator. We're going to understand how the calculator is working to evaluate that expression. Notice I picked a value very close to 0. I picked point 1 because I know that this polynomial we get is going to be good for points around x equals 0. But if I want to like e to the second power or e to the, um, let's say e to the 2.75, something like that, I would have to have more terms, not just a second degree polynomial. Okay, so let's begin. Give me the generic form of a second degree polynomial. Generic form for a second degree polynomial. What might it look like, a second degree polynomial? Uh, x squared plus x plus 1, that's an example of a second degree polynomial, but can you give me like the general form of it? For example, general form of a line might be y equals ax plus b. Okay. I want a general form of a quadratic, of a second degree. Okay, very good. ax squared plus bx plus c. Granted that you know, b might be 0, c might be 0, but a shouldn't be 0. This is really a second degree. So there are three criteria, and each one is going to give us one of the unknowns. The first criteria says f of 0 and p of 0 must be the same. Okay? So what is f of 0? If f of x is e to the x, what is e to the 0? 1. Now, if this polynomial is going to approximate this function around the point 0, then they must be equal at the point 0. So p of 0 and f of 0 must be equal. What is p of 0? a times 0 plus b times 0 plus c, right? And because these must be equal, f of 0 must be equal to p of 0, what should c be? c must be equal to 1. That's the first unknown we have determined. How do we determine that? We use this fact that the function and the polynomial must be equal at that point. Second thing we want, if these are really going to approximate each other, their first derivatives must be equal also. So let's start. First of all, find f prime of x, and then find p prime of x. What is the derivative of e to the x? 
it reacts. That's one reason I picked this example as our first example, because it's very easy to take successive derivatives of e to the x. OK, what do you get if you plug in 0? e to the 0 is still 1, right? So that means f prime of 0 is equal to 1. Now let's find p prime. So p prime of x, the first derivative with respect to x is what? First give me in terms of x. What is the derivative of this polynomial? Think of A as a constant. You're differentiating with respect to x. So it's going to be 2ax, very good, plus b. Derivative of c is 0 because c is just a constant. Now evaluate this at 0. What do we get? Plugging 0 for x, in other words. We get b, but this b must be equal to this one from here, right? So b must be equal to 1. And finally, can you determine c using the second derivatives? What is the second derivative with respect to x? Take it from here. If this is the first derivative, what is the second derivative? I already heard of one correct answer. So if p prime of x equals 2ax plus b, what is the second derivative with respect to x? Again, look at this and differentiate it with respect to x. Derivative of 2ax is 2a, right? And what is the derivative of b with respect to x? 0. On the other hand, also, let's determine what is f double prime. Well, this is our good old friend e to the x. No matter how many times you differentiate, you get still e to the x, right? So this is still at 0, it's still 1, right? So these must be equal. So this must be equal to 1. Because think about it, if it's a constant, even when you plug in 0 for x, there is nothing to plug in. It's still 2a, and it must be equal to 1. So a must be equal to 1 half. So we have determined a, b, and c. That's all you need. So that means we know our polynomial. And the polynomial is ax squared plus bx, that's 1 times x, plus c. What was our c? 1. Okay. So this is our polynomial that approximates this mystery function e to the x. Again, that's a very, very complex function. This is a very simple polynomial. And we're saying that these are going to be, roughly speaking, the same things as long as you're looking at points close to 0, because that, those were the assumptions we made, that they were equal at 0, first derivatives were equal at 0, and the second derivatives. So now can you estimate e to the point 1? Think about it. e to the point 1 would have no clue. How does one evaluate point 1? You know, perhaps point 1 is 10th root, and you could do lots of trial and error, a lot of work involved there. But here is a very easy approach. All we're saying is, uh, to approximate e to the point 1, that means x is point 1, right? So what should I do? Find a polynomial at the point, point 1. And polynomials are easy to evaluate. They are not black box function. Once again, all they are uh, basically is uh, they are four operations, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. If you know those four operations, you can evaluate any polynomial. So let's see what we're getting here. One point one zero five, is that right? Okay. Now, just out of curiosity, let's see what the calculator would give us. I don't know if you already did that, didn't you? Uh, e to the point one. Excuse me, let's see, e to the power of 0.1, and you got 1.105. It gives you more decimals, but to the first three significant figures, it's exactly the same, right? So it's really amazing. And, and guess what? Your calculators must have some sort of algorithms that actually use this idea, use these polynomial approximations. So the correct answer from the calculator is 1.10517, and we got a very close answer to that, as you can see. I'm going to give you one homework very similar to this problem we just did. Would you please write this example down? 
basically same question, but I want you to do it for a different function, not e to the x, but the square root of x plus 1. And then I want you to evaluate or estimate the square root of 1.3. Once again, we would have no clue how the calculator goes about that. But if you can convert it into a polynomial, the radical function is going to be converted into a polynomial, then it becomes four operations. We can handle that, right? So I will ask you first thing about this question next class. And don't forget, I also gave you another homework besides, of course, your group activities and your regular homework problems. All right, I'm going to give you guys the answer to that last question. Um, and here it goes. The polynomial that approximates f of x should be the second degree polynomial that approximates the given function around x equals 0 should be negative 1 over 8x squared plus 1 half x plus 1. And uh, just an, another hint when you're estimating the value of the square root of 1 plus uh, 1.3, please remember that the original function was 1 plus x function, not the square root of x. It was the square root of 1 plus x. So if you're evaluating the square root of 1.3, think about what x will be that you're plugging in into your polynomial. And I'm not giving you the answer to that because that one you can easily check with your calculator as to if you got the answer correctly. It should be very close to the calculator answer. Not exact, but very close. <laughs>